Guys, the Singapore Grand Prix was weird. Ferrari was the fastest of all. A plastic bag ruined a race and Lewis Hamilton produced what was undoubtedly the most confusing hairstyle in the history of Formula 1. And this includes Daniel Ricciardo's afro in his youth. The race started slow, and I mean really, really slow. And when it was supposed to pick up, we got safety cars. And some more safety cars. And another safety car. And then the race was over and all of Charlotte Clark's toys were scattered across the racetrack. Not the most exciting of races, but all the intrigue to keep us going for another week. Hello and welcome to the TF1 show. I'm your host, Tinas Ferreira, the spotlight that illuminates the dusky Singapore track that is the world of F1 and I think it is safe to say that this was a weekend of many surprises. Ferrari's amazing pace during qualifying, Vettel undercutting Leclerc during the race and of course, the most surprising of all, Haas somehow deciding to retain Roman Grosjean for the 2020 season. We'll get into that in a bit, but let's talk about qualifying first and Ferrari's massive supposed resurgence. Well, I think we can all say that was unexpected. I was very surprised and uh, I made my feelings known on Twitter and I was very happy to hang my head in complete humility when Ferrari pitched up and actually had the fastest car in in qualifying yesterday because I was 100% convinced that Mercedes were sandbagging and that they were going to pitch up and blow everybody out of the water. But no, I mean, Leclerc pulled out a stunner of a lap to take pole position and Vettel wasn't that far away. Um, and then we need to ask ourselves, how did this happen? It's, I mean, we all thought, and I was the absolute proponent of this, that you know Ferrari had their time to shine in, in, Spa, in Spa and in Monza and that coming to Singapore was going to be a return to the status quo where Mercedes and Red Bull were going to fight for uh, the top honors during qualifying and during the race. But surprise, Ferrari brought a new front wing, a new floor and a new diffuser to um, upgrade their cars with. And from from the look of it, it seems to have worked a treat. I think um, both Vettel and Leclerc confirmed on Friday already that they could see in the data some improvements and that they could feel the balance of the car has changed slightly where they're now generating a bit more front downforce which was the main purpose of this upgrade package that they brought along and I think they were pretty pleased with with how it all came together but they also admitted that even they were surprised at this the pace relative to Mercedes and Red Bull and that they didn't expect to be that much quicker or in you know, if at all quicker than than those two teams. And upon reflection and a bit of reading and a bit of listening to some interviews, I think we can draw the following conclusions. And firstly, there was definitely an improvement brought along by the upgrades, but their impact was inflated versus Mercedes and Red Bull due to a couple of reasons. Now, we need to realize that Singapore is a very unique and temperamental track that can sometimes throw up strange results. Let's, you know, look at what happened last year in 2018 where Mercedes traditionally struggled at Singapore with their long wheelbase, low rake design and Red Bull and Ferrari were seen as the much, much stronger team when it came to performance at Singapore. And then we pitched up last year and Lewis Hamilton got pole by quite a very big margin put in a very good lap, of course, and basically they walked away during the race, bar a few traffic issues, uh, if I remember correctly. So last year was as big of a surprise, where we all thought that Ferrari and Red Bull were going to be in contention for the win, and then Mercedes all of a sudden, I don't know, pitched up and stole the show. So just keep that in mind, that Singapore is a bit of a 
an odd one given um, just the demands of the track and the demands on the teams as well. Now, another interesting thing that I picked up, and I only thought a bit about this, you know, after seeing the qualifying results and having a bit of a think about potential reasons for Ferrari's massive turnaround. And then I thought back to my stats corner analysis that I did earlier in the week, where I effectively, if you guys haven't seen it, it's on it's on my social media pages, where I effectively go and predict what I think the average qualifying time per team will be um, for each of the races. And I do that by looking at the the 2018 2017 qualifying times over each of the tracks across the season and trying to get an idea of which tracks are the most highly correlated with Singapore in this case. And I was quite surprised to see that thought Monaco was was I think the had the highest correlation with into it which intuitively made sense to me given that both tracks are city tracks and both tracks are seen as high down for circuits so I thought you know that makes sense. But what was surprising to me is that the second most correlated track was Canada, so the Montreal track, and the third most correlated track was Bahrain. Um, the, and uh, I think if you remember correctly, both Canada and Bahrain were tracks where Ferrari actually had the fastest car, especially in qualifying. And when I saw it initially, I thought... That's quite strange, but obviously I still went with it and used, you know, the the numbers to predict my model and, and if, you know, for the stats corner and for my predictions. And then when I thought about it afterwards, I realized that it actually makes more sense than you'd initially think. Because if you look at the Singapore track, and I think Bahrain especially has this characteristic where it still has slow corners. Bahrain has quite a few slow corners, but it's of a very angular nature, if you can call it that. It's very point and squirt. So it's a slow corner and then a straight, and then a slow corner and then a straight, and then a slow corner and then a straight, which is very much similar to Singapore. Now, obviously, the straights aren't, I think, as long as they are in Bahrain, which obviously, and we all know the straights are the main advantage that Ferrari has this year. But it's all very... You know, it's 90 degree corners. It's a corner and then it's a straight. And then it's another corner and then it's a straight. And the Ferrari has good traction out of the corner. So that's never been a weakness of the Ferrari this year. So I think even though people kept hammering on the fact that this is a high downforce track and it's a lot of slow corners, I still think the nature of the slow corners might have actually played into Ferrari's favor, which is, I think, why we didn't see the the gain from Mercedes and Red Bull in the second and third sectors that are the the twistier bits. And um, Ferrari still had the straight line speed advantage in the first sector with the longest straight. So I think I might be mistaken, obviously, take all of this as a pinch of salt, but this is just my, you know, musings, if you can call it that, or my me putting my thinking cap on and having a think as to why Ferrari's performance was so much better than expected. And I think... Obviously, we'll need to wait and see what happens in Russia next week. Russia has also a bit of a mixed bag. It has quite a few long straights, a few fast corners, and then a bit of a twisty final sector. So it's going to be interesting to see if Ferrari can can still do well in the twisty final sector. But I think, most importantly, we have to watch and wait and, and see what happens in Suzuka. Because Suzuka has a few corners that will separate the boys from the men, is all I'm saying. And if Ferrari can keep things going in in Suzuka, then I'm going to be properly impressed. And then I think Mercedes has a big fight on their hands, not only for the rest of this year, but for next year as well, because Ferrari now seems to have the better engine. And if they have sorted out their handling issues, then they're going to be a very formidable package to beat. But just to get back to the Singapore race, I think so over and above the fact that I think the Singapore track might have had some hidden characteristics that actually uh, the Ferrari car liked. I also think Mercedes and Red Bull underperformed during qualifying, with uh, the silver cars especially not being able to nail their tire warm-up. And I think we saw this as well when you, if you watched qualifying, that there was so much you know, jockeying and jostling for track position again to make sure that they're in the right point and the right place to start their lap 
that I think both Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas didn't get their tie warm up right for either of their, their final qualifying laps, especially their first one uh, in Q3 where you saw them being more than a second off initially off the pace. So, And I think Toto Wolff came out later on and admitted that he actually thinks that they dropped the ball a bit, that they didn't maximize their qualifying or at all, and that they are going to have to do a bit better in the race. And I think Red Bull sort of shared these sentiments. I think they had a bit of a bigger power deficit, and I also think they somehow didn't nail the balance of the car from the get-go. So they also didn't get everything right in terms of qualifying setup, or then it, it turns out in the race as well. But so in conclusion, I think Ferrari sprung a surprise and their engine modes are still the class of the field. But I'm still not 100% convinced that they have magically solved all of their problems in one weekend. I think it was wonderful for them how everything turned out and I'll talk about it just now. But I think we just need to hold out a bit before we make sweeping statements about Ferrari's magical and majestic return. Okay, so let's talk about their drivers and um, let's start with our victor, Sebastian Vettel. Now, he struggled on Friday and both of them actually struggled on Friday, but Vettel struggled on Friday. He struggled on Saturday. His first run in Q3 was quite good. And then I was like, thank goodness the guy finally caught some wind or he caught a, he just had a wake up call because he was sort of nowhere in Q1 and Q2. And then in Q3, finally on the first run, he actually put in quite a good lap and, and was in provisional pole. But as has been happening recently, his younger teammates snatched the pole position, you know, in a last gasp, very much on the limit lap. And then Lewis Hamilton also snuck in second place with a great lap from him as well. And uh, Vettel had to start in third place. And, you know, the press and the social media accounts and myself, all of us just, you know, rolled our eyes and said, you know, Singapore was supposed to be Vettel's favorite track and look, he lost out to his teammate again and it's just disaster. And I did a whole episode on my podcast about, you know, how Vettel really needs to pick things up. And it was just the, the headlines are writing themselves. And um, now look, I mean, what a good race he drove. He won um, after getting the undercut uh, over Charles Leclerc and um, obviously with uh, with a bit of controversy. But I mean, he, 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 did it, he did it but first. He got the benefit of the undercuts. He had a very, very strong outlap um, that I think we just need to take note of. I think he had the best outlap out of any of the, the top drivers. And I think that was what made the difference in the end. And uh, that and the fact that Ferrari underestimated the power of the undercuts. I think Toto Wolff as well, he admitted that they didn't think that the new tires were going to make such a big difference compared to, you know, the soft tires that the others were on um, from the beginning of the race. But Vettel put on the new tires and Verstappen as well, and they just smashed their outlaps and got ahead of, of Charles Leclerc, which then obviously meant that that old, old Monsieur Leclerc wasn't impressed at all when he saw his teammate come out in front of him. And I think he had he has the right to be annoyed. I think, firstly, people... You know, saying that you shall needs to grow up. He you can't whine like that over the radio. I mean, firstly, it's under stressful situation. He's in the heat of battle, and everybody else would have been just as annoyed. If you qualified on pole position, you were doing everything right to lead the race, and then all of a sudden the team decides to put your teammate first from third position. He undercuts you. All of a sudden, you're behind him. Obviously, you're going to be annoyed. I would be annoyed. Literally, every single driver on that grid would have been annoyed. So, I feel that's fine. He maybe was a bit annoyed over the radio for a, a longer time than necessary. But I felt he was justified in his annoyance. And, you know, adding to that, he was quite diplomatic and pragmatic out of the car. He didn't do anything stupid afterwards. He didn't you know, make some big deal out of it or make big drama. He effectively said, we're going to talk after the race. He showed that he's not happy, but he was still gracious on the podium and afterwards. I think this was a bit of a wake-up call for him, though, that he's not quite yet 
the boy wonder and the the ruler of of the Ferrari team. I think he can still leave with his head held very high. His pole lap was excellent work, and he's just going to get better and better. Um, I do think he has a very good chance of finishing second in the drivers' championship. And I mean, he has now a first and a first and now a second in Singapore at a track that they didn't expect to do well at all. So I think Charles Leclerc is still very much in the ascendancy despite his uh, slight annoyance or, well, not a slight annoyance at, you know, how the strategy worked out for him today. I think the more important thing now is to ask whether this result is going to be a game changer for Vettel. Now, we all know Vettel is very much an emotional creature, as I mentioned on my... Um, podcast last week and sometimes just a result like this even though he himself would know that this was a bit of an engineered result that he wasn't technically he didn't outdrive Leclerc per se even though actually you know the safety cars neutralized it at the end but the way Vettel got through uh, you know that Ricardo Gasly Giovinazzi traffic after his pit stop was actually pretty damn impressive I was I felt that was the best racing Vettel has done in quite a long time in terms of making some um, definitive passing moves stick and getting through the field and, and maximizing his advantage now that he had the advantage over Leclerc. He was by far and away the quickest through through that traffic and Leclerc struggled, I think, a fair bit more than he did. So I think that was quite a good... If, if there was anything that I would take from the race, if I was Sebastian Vettel, I would take those few laps and say, there, I did a very good job. And that's something... And that level is, is I think, a level he would like to get back to uh, for, the, for the next races. And um, I think also it seems like the upgrades... That the, or the changes that Ferrari has made to the car now seems to suit his driving style more, which I guess makes sense, right? Because they've now effectively added a lot more, well, not a lot more, but they've added more downforce to the front wing, which then means that they can balance the car a bit better in terms of the rear. And I think that then um, makes, thing, makes things a lot better for Sebastian Vettel, and hopefully it means he likes the handling characteristics of the car more. And um, another interesting thing for for Sebastian Vettel is now that there's a bit of fire between him and and Charles Leclerc. So let's hope for some more explosive battles over the coming races. I think all in all, a very positive weekend for Ferrari with their first one, two in a long time. And also the first time that they've won three races in a row since 2008, which is 11 years ago. And, uh, they're very much in the ascendancy and I'm going to be interested to see if they can take this momentum to Russia next week and especially Suzuka in a few more weeks' time. All right, let's talk about Mercedes. And I think for them, the weakest weekend since Germany, I would say, um, which is, I guess, sad for them since it all started so well uh, in practice on Friday. They were way out in front and uh, it looked at that stage that there was no beating them at all. And I think all of the other teams were were unanimous in their view that Mercedes was definitely going to be very, very difficult to beat. But again, uh, it, as I said with Ferrari, all of a sudden the tables were turned on the Saturday and Mercedes were the ones under pressure trying to somehow pull a rabbit out of the hat and, you know, not make qualifying a complete disaster. So let's maybe talk about Valtteri Bottas first. He fell away in qualifying, which I found disappointing because he was actually faster than Hamilton in Q1 and Q2, if I'm not mistaken. He was quite on top of things and I was very impressed. And then in Q3, he just sort of, things were a bit bleh. And I think it's mostly due to the tire warm-up issues that they had and all of the jockeying for position in the warm-up lap. But... I think if Valtteri was a bit more up in the grid, you know, if his starting position today was higher, it could have created some strategic options for him. Um, And I think him starting in fifth place meant that he was always going to be second priority after Hamilton in the race. Now, he was a bit angry about Hamilton overtaking him on their last, you know, just before starting their last run in Q3. He then felt that it it compromised his his warm-up, and I guess it did, but... I mean, bruh, don't let your teammate walk over you like that. Do something about it then. Um, I think 
Valtteri was quite strong in the race. I think he drove, actually drove a very good race. He didn't, I think, do much wrong. The nature of how the race panned out just sort of tied his hands behind his back. And then also, I guess, you know, James Valls, the, the head strategist for Mercedes, telling him effectively that even though he did get the undercut over Hamilton, he had to basically drive slowly or I think it was he, he had to put in 148.8 laps to also i guess keep alex albon behind him because alex albon would have also uh, uh, undercut hamilton but i think it's now from this race on very clear that bottas is going to be the number two for the rest of the season even if he doesn't believe it yet because i think mercedes has decided also given how ferrari has stepped up their game now i think mercedes are now going to start deploying rear gunner bottas uh, with more regularity and I think he's just going to have to accept it again and maybe her Bottas 3.0 in 2020 can maintain a championship campaign for longer than three races. Now let's talk about Hamilton. Um, he was super strong on Friday, as I've mentioned, and he admitted he struggled on Saturday. He said he lost a lot of confidence in the car. Doesn't know why. I don't know why, but I guess that's that. Um, I think he still put in a very good lap under pressure to start on the front row because it was looking quite grim for them um, initially uh, after the first runs in Q3 where he was, I think, a second off Vettel, which I was quite surprised by. But he came out and said, yeah, well, tire warm-up, entire preparation for that qualifying lap was an absolute disaster. In any case, um, I think he was quite frustrated with the team today because he had a clear idea of wanting to be aggressive and wanting to take a few chances for strategy, but the team didn't allow him to. He was actually asking for, for them to undercut Leclerc, uh, but the team decided to go long. But at the same time, I guess hindsight is twenty twenty. He was correct in saying, I think Hamilton after the race, that the team is at the moment too reactive and not aggressive enough and that they need to pull up their socks because um, I think today, again, was the opportunity to be aggressive, given that they had the fastest fastest car in race trim. Um, and also, of course, they haven't won since Hungary, which is now actually feels like quite a long time ago. So they need to go to Russia and they need to take the initiative and get their momentum back. I still think they, they, they have the package to beat. I think if they string everything together, they're going to be the fastest. But they have a bit of an issue now where Ferrari effectively uses their superior engine power to qualify in front of them and then they're going to have to try and somehow overtake them in the race and up to now that strategy hasn't worked out too well for them okay let's talk about red bull now basically i think very similar stories to mercedes to what i've just mentioned about the team they came here to win and verstappen came away with the third place as uh, not fortunate but i mean it I wouldn't say they were. Verstappen was the third fastest driver today. He he got things worked out well for him with the strategy, with the undercuts, and then also the subsequent three safety cars near the end of the race, which meant he could protect his tires. I think if we would have seen, I think a different race if the three safety cars didn't happen in quick succession, because probably Ferrari and Red Bull would have run out of tires to an extent, and I think. Mercedes and Hamilton's strategy to, to, to stay out longer on the soft tires and then to have fresher tires for the end of the race would have paid off a bit more. Whether Hamilton would have been able to make overtake stick, I don't know. Track position seems to be very important in Singapore, but uh, that's the way the cookie crumbled and Max Verstappen got a third place finish. I think Red Bull will come away disappointed given that Verstappen had a bit of an average weekend. He didn't really light it up at any point in time. He struggled in practice, also wasn't super comfortable in qualifying. He was quite annoyed after qualifying, actually saying that he didn't have the grip he wanted and he was whiny about the engine as well. Um, and then also Alex Albon. I feel it was a decent performance from him. I don't think you can say he didn't do a good job. He was able to keep his nose pinned to Bottas's gearbox where... Gasly probably would have ended up somewhere behind Grosjean in 12th place and then, you know, would have had to fight his way to a bizarre 8th or something. I don't know. Nothing against Gasly. He actually did a really good job this weekend. But I think the way Albon sliced through the traffic gave me some hope. 
that he can actually step up in that car. I think Red Bull will hope for better in Russia. Uh, there's not really much to write home about after this Grand Prix. And as I've said, I think they're going, going to be quite disappointed with, with what ended up happening. So, um, the midfield, let's let's give the, the overview of the midfield. I'll quickly chat about each of the teams, just give a few of my thoughts. Uh, I won't keep you guys too long. Now, McLaren, I think their weekend was a mixed bag. Science did very well in qualifying to get 7th place. Norris, I think, got 10th. Um, he, Norris, Landon Norris performed extremely well early on in qualifying with, you know, Q1 and Q2. He put in some brilliant laps. And then in Q3, things, were, uh, things went a bit pear-shaped for him. He made a couple of mistakes, and he was actually quite candid about them afterwards. But I guess, you know, you win some, you lose some. And he's also someone like Leclerc, I think, who's learning uh, learning from every mistake that he makes. And I think Lano Norris was, after today, he was my driver of the day with a very controlled drive. He made no mistakes and he even had to absorb quite a bit of pressure from Gasly on fresher tyres at the end to come home best of the rest. Um, poor Carlos Sainz, he was unlucky after a bit of a, you know, a hapless move from Nico Hülkenberg on the first lap of the race to somehow sc- scrape past, and uh, that then meant he had some floor damage, and he had a puncture, and yeah, his race is, was effectively unravelled from that point on, so... Pity for science. I still think he's really doing a good job in that McLaren. He's really making mistakes. I don't think I can't remember the last time he made a proper proper mistake. Um, he's just been very unlucky recently. So I really hope his luck turns soon. Um, talking about Nico Hulkenberg and Renault, he actually came off the better of the two Renaults. Uh, you know, in eighth place, which I guess is a good haul of points after qualifying in ninth. Now, he had the accident with Sainz, which was silly. And it also meant he had his work cut out for him because he, I think, also had a bit of damage after that incident. Now, poor Daniel Ricciardo. He, I thought his performance in today's race was daring. It was aggressive. I think he, he pulled up some brilliant overtakes. If you want to go and watch on YouTube, there was quite a few nice ones. A few very late lunges on the brakes that he, that he pulled off. And um, then one of his moves actually ended up giving him, giving him a puncture, which then meant he had to, you know, trundle around until he got back to the pits and then having to put on a new set of tires. But I still think he did quite well to get back up the field. Um, but his race was compromised from the start. Now, for those who don't know, there was this bizarre incident with Ricardo's car where in Q1, apparently, his engine or his electrical, ba- his battery deployment in his engine. Now, bear with me, it's going to get a bit technical. His battery deployment in his engine was too high for 0.00001 seconds. And that effectively showed up on the FIA's data, which then meant he was disqualified from qualifying and that he had to start from the back of the grid. Now, what was interesting is that, other than the fact that this deployment was... Uh, only for 0.0001 of a second, and that it happened on his slow qualifying lap. So, in other words, the lap that didn't even count for his time in Q1. The FIA decided straight, no, black and white, you're not allowed to deploy more energy than that, and therefore he is disqualified from qualifying. Now, I don't know how to feel about this. I feel it might be... but it comes across... As very harsh. I felt it was a bit harsh given that earlier on in the weekend, Mercedes were also you know, slapped on the wrist for Hamilton's fuel being cooler than some, specific, some specified level relative to the ambient air temperature. And Mercedes got a fine, so a monetary fine. I guess that because it happened in practice and Ricardo's happened in, happened in qualifying, I guess that's why I was disqualified. I actually don't know what the physical rules are around the punishments or the consequences of having an engine or a battery deployment higher than the, re, uh, the required or the allowed amount. But Ricardo came out and said he was not happy at all. And he came out and said that the stewards effectively ruined his race and ruined his weekend. And it's difficult to argue with him on that. But I guess... The rules are the rules. 
So he's just going to have to deal with it. Now, it's going to be really fascinating to see McLaren and Renault battle for that fourth position in the Constructors since they seem to be on relatively similar pace now and it's going to be a seesaw, I think, depending on you know driver performance, depending on the type of track, depending on the car. It's going to be really interesting to see how that battle turns out before we get to the last race of the season. Cool. Now, Toro Rosso, I think we can give Pierre Gasly a round of applause. He made the strategy work for him to score some good points for the team and he comprehensively outscored his teammates. I think Kvyat had an off-color weekend. He wasn't really that strong, you know, anywhere. And his overtake on Raikkonen that ended Raikkonen's race, and um, I think it was optimistic, if we're being kind. So not a great weekend for Kvyat. Talking about not great weekends, Racing Point had a horrible weekend and a horrible race. Um, Sergio Perez usually goes well here, but he once again got hit by reliability gremlins and he had to stop on the track, and uh, which I think caused the first of the safety cars. Lance Stroll was as shocking in qualifying as ever, and he had a very scrappy race. Uh, this is one to forget for Racing Point, and not much more that I can say there. Haas, um, ugh, what can you say? The biggest sideshow in Formula 1 continues its march of ridiculousness. I do think, you know, all joking aside, Magnussen drove quite a solid race. And then of all things, a plastic bag got stuck in his wing, which meant he dropped places like a stone. He lost all front downforce, apparently, and he just couldn't keep a position. Raman Grosjean was um, just being silly as usual, and his uh, move on George Russell was actually stupid. Like, Russell was way ahead in the corner, and Grosjean sticking his nose in there, I don't really see the point, and it ruined Russell's race. Grosjean actually ended up finishing 11th or 12th, if I'm not mistaken, can't remember, but didn't end up ruining Grosjean's race, but he just, yeah, again, doing some silly things in the race itself. And on that, I really don't get why Haas retained Grosjean for next year. Now, most people, including myself, thought that Nico Hülkenberg was a very good option for Haas to put alongside Gavin Magnussen. But, you know, there are rumors saying that Hülkenberg was too expensive for Haas and that Hülkenberg also wasn't that keen to sign with them. But, I mean, Roman Grosjean has really, really... You know, last year he had a tough beginning at a tough beginning to the season, but then the second half of his 2018 season was really, I think, the thing that convinced Haas to retain him for, for, for this season. But Grosjean hasn't had the performance this year where I thought, you know what? Actually, Grosjean might be a, a, a good idea, or he might be the best driver for them to keep. I think they have so many other talented options to try and put in that car and see how they end up going with, with Magnussen. But, you know, they stuck with him. Don't know why. Don't ask me. Um, they say they didn't want to upset the apple cart. They didn't. They wanted consistency. But, I mean, if you are consistency bad, almost use the, uh, a naughty word there. If you're consistency bad, consistently bad, then why would you not want to change? I don't get I get the argument of not changing if things are going well, but things are very much not going well. So not understanding Haas's logic there, but whatever. They probably know better than I do. Okay, Alfa Romeo, ladies and gentlemen, Antonio Giovinazzi was one entire leader of a Grand Prix for more than one lap, and then he scored a whole entire couple of championship points. And he made zero accidents on his own. What a race and what a strong weekend for him. He also out-qualified Raikkonen. So really, I think probably Giovinazzi's strongest weekend of the season. And I'm pleased for him because I think he has been doing a good job. But he just he's never had anything to show for it. So well done, Antonio Giovinazzi. Kimi Raikkonen was average. He did quite well in the race and then he crashed with Kvyat, um, not really his fault, I think, that one, but uh, so it wasn't a great end to what was, I think, an average weekend to begin with. Lastly, Williams. Well, Robert Kubica, I think he deserves some praise this week, since he put up some robust fighting against much faster opposition today. 
But I also think it's good that he decided to step away from Formula One. Um, I think he has proven his points. He has made his triumphant return. And now he can move on to greener pastures. You know, he's been talking about maybe going into DTM. And I think that's definitely a very good idea for him. George Russell was pretty anonymous throughout the race. Um, he made a mistake in qualifying and then he had an accident with Grosjean, which put him out of his ra- put him out of the race, which was also his first retirement of the season so far, which is actually quite impressive. But then, you know, if the only car you're ever racing is your teammates, I guess the probability of having an accident does decrease slightly. Um, overall, nothing too interesting to report in terms of George Russell. I think not one of his stronger weekends, but I guess let's see if he can bounce back for Russia next week. Cool, let's move on to the TF1 Awards. Now, the Pasta Maldonado Award for Most Dunderheaded Deed is a joint award between Haas F1 team for retaining Roman Grosjean and Roman Grosjean for validating Haas winning this award by driving into Russell for no reason. The Lewis Hamilton Hashtag Blessed Award goes to Sebastian Vettel for how the strategy worked out today. He wasn't the fastest Ferrari driver this whole weekend, but a sequence of laps and one undercut can change many, many things. Lastly, the Nico Hulkenberg Podium Award for Unluckiest Driver has to go to Kevin Magnussen because a plastic bag Really? I've never seen someone drop down the order so quickly since Kevin Magnussen in the Belgian Grand Prix. Let's, as always, give a massive round of applause to all of our award winners today. What do we think of the Singapore Grand Prix as a whole? Now, I think this is my least favorite one since France, uh, mainly due to the ridiculous slow driving at the beginning. Now, I realize the strategy behind it with the whole, you know, trying to prevent the undercut by never actually opening up pit window for, for the guys behind Leclerc. But it was so dumb having to watch them crawl around for lap after lap. Nobody even trying to get past. It was just, it was stupid to see. But this track looks spectacular and the scenery is amazing. And I guess it always produces unforeseen results and a lot of drama. So it can stay. Hopefully we can sort out this tire degradation disaster and that we don't see this crawling about um, for, the, for the next year's Grand Prix and, and then thereafter because, I mean, it was stupid. If someone arg- wants to argue with me about it, feel free. Christian Horner called it boxes circling each other in the ring. But boxes don't circle each other in the ring for 45 minutes. That's like 45 minutes to watch if one car's drive as slowly as possible is stupid. Now, we only have one week till Russia and there are so many questions to answer before then. Will Vettel and Leclerc's relationship start to sour? Will Mercedes be able to find their mojo and upgrades to get back on winning form? Will Gunther Steiner suffer from the worst case of buyer's remorse since McLaren decided to buy Honda engines in 2015? As always, much to ponder. And now I think we can conclude today's episode. And once again, thanks for listening and subscribing. It has been so fun starting this podcast and getting to know some of the people listening every week. I do hope you enjoy it. And please feel free to chat with me on Twitter or Instagram. The Russian Grand Prix is only a couple of days away. And I'm extremely excited since Russia has undoubtedly the best national anthem in the world. And I can't wait to hear it again. So hopefully that will make up for what's probably going to be a very boring race. Cheers.